not fun. All right. Dave Hunt was commenting about an interview that he had heard or read about, and he was making some notes on it. It took place in Portland, Oregon. It was with the noted atheist Christopher Hitchens. And, and this is what Dave said. Dave said, you know, this atheist, Chris, uh, Christopher Hitchens, laid down some seriously good theology. And you're kind of saying, how'd that work? Well, this is kind of how it happened. He actually wrote a book, Hitchens, called God is Not Great, Why Religion Poisons Everything. So you can see his point of view. I mean, you can see his worldview. You know where he's coming from. Noted atheist and author, books denying the existence or denying the God. He was being interviewed by a Unitarian, which claims to fall in the Christian fold, Unitarian minister Marilyn Sewell. And the following exchange took place near the start of the interview. Sewell. The religion you cite in your book is generally the fundamentalist faith of various kinds. I am a liberal Christian, and I don't take the stories from the scripture literally. I don't believe in the doctrine of atonement, that Jesus died for our sins, for example. Do you make any distinction between fundamentalist faith and liberal religion? And this is what that noted atheist Christopher Hitchens said to her. I would say that if you don't believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ and Messiah, and that he rose again from the dead, and by his sacrifice our sins are forgiven, you're really not in any meaningful way a Christian. That's good theology from an atheist. So Sewell, who is a Unitarian minister, wanted no part in this discussion. And her next words were, let's go someplace else. The little snippet demonstrates an important point about religious God talk. You can call yourself anything you want, but if you don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the, from the dead, you are not in any meaningful way a Christian. In one of the delicious ironies of our time, an outspoken atheist grasps the central tenet of Christianity better than many Christians do. What you believe about Jesus Christ really does make a difference. It really does make a difference. Who is this Jesus that the New Testament describes and the Old Testament prophesies about? Who is this one? End quote. So if a person does not believe Jesus is who he said he was or did what he said he would do, and that by his sacrifice, a person by faith receives forgiveness of sins, you're not in any meaningful sense a Christian. That was the problem for which John wrote 1 John. That's why he wrote this letter. See, many of the letters were written to, to combat a heresy that had arisen. Some letters were just written for doctrinal teaching, Paul's letters, for example. But some letters were written in response to something that's going on in the churches of that day to counteract a false teaching that was out there. So that's the reason why John writes 1 John. And we'll be in chapter 1 today, and as I'll do the best I can. In the first service, I realized right away that this was way too much to bite off in one sermon, but we'll, we'll do it. We'll make it happen. We'll get you out of here on the normal time, whatever normal is in our church service. We'll get you out of the normal time, but I just want you to know it is a mouthful that we're going to look at today. And in chapter 1, he says this to us. God manifested himself in Jesus Christ, and through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, a person has forgiveness of sins and fellowship with God and with other believers. That's what he's going to lay down in this first chapter right here. These important things, who Jesus is, what he has done, and the immediate result, how that interacts with us and God and us and other people who claim faith in Jesus as well. It's likely that John wrote this letter out of Ephesus. And he was in Ephesus. He was not the pastor of Ephesus. Timothy, if you remember, was the pastor of the church at Ephesus. So he wasn't the pastor there, but he was a guest there, an honored guest. It's likely, we are told, since Jesus gave his mother to John to take care of, that right before AD 70, when the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem, John left with Mary and they went off to Ephesus and she may have likely died there in Ephesus. But John is writing these, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John from, the, from Ephesus. 
to combat something that's going around in the churches of his region of Asia Minor right now. So look at verses 1 through 5. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the logos of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Who is this person of Jesus? Who is this one that the New Testament writers were writing about? Who is this one who manifested himself to the world? Who is this Jesus? Now, some people who were earlier attached to the Christian communities had left the Christian communities and, and had adopted this heretical teaching, which we would call, probably described, an early form of Gnosticism. And you're kind of going, Gnosticism, what? It's simply a Greek word that means to be in the know, to know. So you get initiated into the know. There's a group of the people who know, or you could call them the knowing ones, and they have all information. And if you want to be like a first class, class Christian, you get into the group of those in the know, and, and they'll, they'll secret handshake, and they'll teach you how to go, and you'll be in the group. So that's basically what they're talking about. And, and Gnostic, it's, it's, to make it simple, it's simply this. Gnostics believe that the spirit is good. But anything material, flesh, is evil. So in their mind, they could not imagine God who is infinitely holy and righteous and good, how he could take on flesh, which was evil. That would be contrary to the nature of God is in their thinking. So that's what he's trying to describe right here. Who is the person of Jesus really? These false teachers are going out and saying, this is who he is, and it's on this early form of Gnosticism. And, and John is saying, no, 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 that's, that's not who he was. We saw him. We heard him. We touched him. I was there at the resurrection. I know. I'm a witness. So these traveling teachers went around as interim preachers and teachers, and they would stop anywhere they could and get a listen from any of the people who would pay attention to them. And that's why when you read uh, later in, in, in uh, third, third John, where he says, don't even bring these people into your house. Because if you bring these teachers into your house, you're agreeing with their teaching and you're saying that it's good. So don't even bring them into your house, actually, is what he says. So this is the group of people he's talking about right now. So he calls out these heretics as not being genuine Christians. Now, what you're going to see as we go through the book of John is he's really direct. I think to put it in the vernacular of today, we would say John really gets in your face. He will tell you exactly. He's not going to shade it. He's not going to, he's not going to even put nicety to it. He's going to be right up front and in our face this whole time as we go through this. So get used to it. And remember, don't get mad at me. I didn't write it. Okay. I'm just going to tell you what's here, but don't get mad at me. So doctrinally speaking, these false teachers were influenced by this early form of Gnostic teaching. So that's what they're thinking. Again, they're thinking God is spirit. And that's good. But God could not possibly be contaminated with human flesh because that's evil. Matter is evil. So what they basically believed is that this Eon Christ, or the spirit of the Messiah, the Christ, came upon the man Jesus at his baptism, but left the man Jesus right before his passion, his suffering, and his crucifixion. So that's their, their thinking in their mind. Daniel Akin, Akin comments, John is finding a Christological, in other words, a, a teaching about Jesus, heresy, that involved the denial of the incarnation of deity, that is, the denial that the Christ was a historical Jesus. Apparently, the heresy involved the separation of Christ and the Son of God from Jesus. Two separate, one is the Spirit, which is good, and one is flesh, which is evil. The issue this epistle addresses is not that the heretics believe Jesus to be someone other than the Christ. 
and believed in Jesus anyway, but rather that they believed the Christ to be someone other than Jesus. So this spirit of Christ came upon the man Jesus, two separate things in their thinking. This was a direct assault on the person of Jesus, a denial of his deity, and one that would call into question his work of atonement as well. So they're both wrapped up who he is and what he has done. So he wants to emphasize to us the incarnation, or we could call it the enfleshment of God. The incarnation, the enfleshment of God. God takes on human flesh. God enters into the human race to become the redeemer of all who believe on his name. R.C.H. Linsky wrote about this man who was in Ephesus during the days of John, who was a proponent of the teaching that we're talking about right now. His name was Corinthus. He was active at Ephesus during this time, and he taught that Jesus was, a, was the physical son of Joseph, that the eon Christ was united with Jesus at his baptism, but left Jesus before his passion and death. He rejected all the Gospels, all of Paul's letters, and accepted only parts of Matthew and of Mark. So this man, Corinthus, was a former Jew from Egypt, so he combined Jewish ideas, Old Testament ideas, with what we may call the beginnings of Gnosticism and sought to produce a spiritualized Mosaism after the Mosaic Law, which would be a universal religion. He retained circumcision and the Sabbath. According to historian Eusebius, who got this from Arrhenius, who was told by Polycarp, I know this is like a dis, dis, okay, B make it simple. Polycarp was a disciple, a direct disciple of John the Apostle. So John told Polycarp, Polycarp called it Arrhenus, and Arrhenus told Eusebius, and he wrote it down, of an event that took place in Ephesus. That John, the disciple of the Lord, having gone to take a bath in Ephesus, and having seen Corinthus inside, left the baths, refusing to bathe, and said... Let us flee, lest also the bass fall in, since Corinthus inside, the enemy of the truth. That's this guy. These are the thinking that's going on in Asia Minor of this time. So doctrinally was the issue of the incarnation, the enfleshment of God. Morally, these false teachers believe that a person could have fellowship with God despite their behavior. So you can live any way you want and still have fellowship with God. So morally speaking, that's what he's talking about. And you know what this belief is still around us today? I mean, think about it. Think about the movies you've watched and think about this statement that I'm about to say. It seems in every movie that you see, whoever dies, we're always told they're looking on, down on us from heaven. Think about it. Everyone goes to heaven in all of the movies. It doesn't matter what they, whether they believed in Jesus or denied Jesus or was a, well, lived a horribly terrible evil life. It doesn't matter. Everyone gets to go to heaven. So this same thought is around for us today, and you see it in a lot of movies that we watch. Everyone seems to make it in from this point of view. So he's also going to deal with some ethical teachings as well. In other words, if you're a genuine Christian, there's ethically in your life, there's going to be evidence. You're going to see that ethically in your life. And socially, these Gnostics were so arrogant, they separated themselves and became the clique. And he's basically talking about destroyed relationships that happen from that as well, socially speaking. So John is writing to strengthen the believer's assurance of their salvation. Can we really trust this Jesus, that he is who he said he was, that he did what he said he did, and the effects of what was to come out of that sacrifice? Can we really trust that and have assurance that the salvation we claim to have in Christ is an eternal salvation? And they were, these, these false teachers were creating doubts within the Christians. So they would be saying this, and the Christians are going, but Timothy preached this the other day, and then the false teacher would say that, and we'd say, yeah, but, but the apostle John had mentioned this earlier. And they're, they're confused, and they're, they're saying, whom should we believe? So John says, let me write it down so you'll know whom to believe. Who, whom shall we believe? Now, He's going to use, John uses a lot of antithetical statements, which means darkness and light, love and hate, life and death. He's going to do all, and you're going to see it over and over again throughout the book. He loves to use it. Like I said, he's very in your face, which is okay. Four times in John, he, in 1 John, he tells us why he wrote the letter. So here they are up here. These are four times. And we're writing these things so that our joy, and some of your translations may say your joy, may be complete. We'll I'll, I'll touch on that in just a second. 1 John 2, 1. My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin ethically. 
But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 2.26, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. Be aware there are liars out there that are not telling you the truth. And then chapter 5, verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So assurance of the believer. These are the reasons why he wrote this book. He told us straight up why he wrote the book. Now, what you, the gospel of John that we have in the four gospels, it was very evangelistic. And that's the purpose of the gospel of John. You get to the end, it says, I write these things so you may believe in Jesus as the Son of God. So it's very evangelistic. This book is not so evangelistic, it's more polemical. In other words, they're going to answer questions about what's going on around them at the time. So it's a, more of a teaching, edifying sort of book, not an evangelistic kind of book. 1 John 10, the idea of possessing eternal life in Jesus Christ, we read this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. It's a gift. And they will never perish. They will maybe perish. No. They will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. So picture the believer being in the hand of Jesus. Now the word snatch is an interesting word. It means to catch away or violently take away by force. It's the same word we, we use in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 with the word, we say rapture. It's translated caught away. So no one can violently take you by force out of Jesus' hand. Okay, but it gets better. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So you, believer, are in the hand of Jesus Christ, and no one can violently take you out of his hand, and that is in the hand of God the Father, and no one can violently take you out of his hand. Now, someone once asked me, well, can't I just walk away? And my response was, are you more powerful than God? He claims to hold you in his hand. Do you think you're more powerful than God that you can get out of his hand? Of course not. That's what he wants them to understand, the assurance of their salvation. He states, hey, look, I saw these things. I'm an eyewitness. I was there. I heard. I've, I've seen. I touched. All these things that we mentioned in the first part of it, that, that this eternal life was provided for us in Christ. And, and he, there's others that are eyewitnesses too. I, I'm one. There are others. In Acts 1.8, we read this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Jesus is talking to his disciples, John, one of which, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. I'm a witness. I saw it. I was there. So he immediately wants to draw our attention. John draws our attention to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Who is this person? What has he done? See, the message and the person cannot be separated. They go hand in hand. For if he is not who he said he was, as C.S. Lewis said, he is a liar. And if he claimed to be something that he was not, then he is a lunatic. And if he is really who he said he was and did really what he said he did, then we should all call him Lord. That's what he wants to say. In John 1.18, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, we're talking about the Logos, God becoming flesh, he has made him known. He has exegeted him. He's, he's manifest. He's revealed him. So the Son came to reveal the Father to us. Jesus Christ, deity from eternity, is John's central message. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was not a God, as some trans a translation would try to tell you. The Word is God. Actually, it says God is the Word in the Greek. We've changed the order just for English sentence structure. This heresy, that Jesus was not God manifested in the flesh, has never gone away. It has never gone away. It is still with us today. I can think of no world religion that claims Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh, the eternal deity manifested in the flesh. They'll say he's a prophet, he's a teacher, he's a, he's a good guy, you should pay attention to his lessons, but not one world religion will say that Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh, that God took on flesh and dwelt among us. 
even among those claiming to be part of the Christian fold, there are groups that do not believe Jesus Christ is the eternal God manifested in the flesh. They will say he is a created being. He is not the eternal God manifested in the flesh. It's, it's around us today. You'll hear it all over the place. Really, when you're talking to someone about faith, about the word, the central question to ask is, who do you believe Jesus is? That is the central question. Not eschatology, the end time study. Not prophecy, as fun as that may be. Not the creation, which I think is marvelous because it talks about God's power and his wisdom. Those are all good things. But the central message you want to talk about is, who do you think Jesus is? It makes all the difference in the world. It's life and death, as a matter of fact. It's that important. Is he a created being? Or is he the eternal son of God? Is he of the same essence of the Father and of the Holy Spirit? Or is he separated from them? When a person believes Jesus, or what a person, whom Jesus, whom a person believes Jesus is, makes all the difference in the world. So he and the other eyewitnesses who had touched the word of life, the eternal God, that had come in the flesh, in John 1, 14, we read this. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So John can say, I saw him. I was there. He told us all about this. This is who he really is. So Jesus not only reveals life, he is actually the source of all life as well. Look at verse 4 of John chapter 1. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So not only is he the source of life, he is the giver of life. So John begins the letter and ends the letter with the same thought, and that is Jesus Christ is the eternal God manifested in the flesh, and all who believe in him will have eternal life that will never perish. That's how he starts the letter. That's how he ends the letter. You'll see when we get to chapter 5, whatever week that may be. Now, verses 1 through 4 are not a typical salutation in a normal letter. Think back with me. Think of Paul's letter. How does he start it normally? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the church is at Rome, grace and peace be to you. Typical salutation from Paul. That's exactly how Paul starts most of his letters. He just tells us who he, he, tells us who he is, what his qualifications are, and to whom he's writing. Notice John doesn't do that, does he? He jumps right into what he wants to tell us. He doesn't even say, hey, this is the apostle John. I walked with Jesus, and I need to tell you this church, this church, this church, Hey, this is what I need to say. He doesn't do that. It's completely different. Instead, they function as a pivotal statement of how he's going to unfold this letter to us. So verses 1 through 4 basically say, this is how I'm going to unfold it to you. This is what I'm going to build on as I go through. No salutation, no regular salutation. Completely atypical. But he talks about that which was from the beginning. The beginning. Beginning means when time began. In Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So when time, he, he be created and time came into being. The eternal God existed before the creation, existed before time began. And in the creation, the beginning began. But John 1.1 1, 1 actually takes us back before the beginning, doesn't it? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He takes us back before the beginning. The word of life, the logos of life, became the bread of life. So all who feast on him will never hunger spiritually. And the logos of life became the light of life. For all who will follow him will not walk in darkness, but walk in the light of life. Jesus is the word because he is the final revelator of the will and thought of God. He came to give us the final revelation of what God wanted humanity to know and closes the revelation with the book called The Revelation, which is the final testimony to who Jesus is and what he has done. In the Old Testament, God revealed himself in multiple ways. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago at many times and in many ways, visions, dreams, audible, multiple different ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Now that's good English and it makes sense. In the Greek, it actually says he has spoken to us in the son of his, in his son. 
The Son is the final revelation. If anyone comes to you and says, I have received a revelation from God that's not recorded here in this word, you can assure them it is not true. For Jesus is the final revelation. There is no revelation following him. I've heard it, John said. I've seen it. Something that happened in the past that has a continuing effect in his life today. I've seen it. I, and it affects me still today what I've seen is the idea. Now, can any of the false teachers claim they saw Jesus? No, none of them. Only John. I, I saw him. They can't claim they saw him. And then he uses this word fellowship. Now, I just have to tell you, fellowship does not mean potluck, okay? As much as I like potlucks, which I always eat too much food at a potluck, it's not a potluck. That's not what fellowship is. Now, you could have fellowship at a potluck, but don't just associate, oh, fellowship, that's a potluck. No, it's, it's much more than that. Fellowship has the idea of sharing something in common. Sharing something in common. Now, it has wider ramifications. It can be used as co contribution. Um, I'm trying to think of some other words the New Testament translates that. But the idea is sharing something in common. That's why you and I as believers in Jesus Christ can never truly have fellowship with a person who's not a believer. Doesn't mean you can't be friends with them. That's not what I'm talking about. We cannot have this biblical sense of fellowship because we share nothing in common with them. I share in common with you one important person, and that's Jesus Christ, and he unites us all together. If you don't have that, you can't share that in common. There can never be true fellowship. So apart from Jesus Christ, no person is in fel fellowship with God because they share nothing in common with God. So John talks about, I I'm writing this because I want your joy and our joy. And, and again, it's a, ver it's a textual variation. You can talk with me about it later. It could, it actually is both. The Christians have a joy for the salvation they have. But as a pastor, John's thinking about it in a pastoral, I'm joyful when I see my children walking in the truth. Think of 2 John. Joyful when I see your children walk in the truth. So it's a both yours and our joy. The joy which comes from abiding in Christ, from the fellowship of the apostolic witness that has been recorded for us here to the incarnation and deity of Jesus Christ. John 15 says this, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And no one can take this joy away, Christian. It may be muted, it can never be taken away. In John 16, we read this. Now, I understand this is dealing with the resurrection of Jesus, but it has a broader ramification. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Christian, no one can steal your joy. It may get muted. It may get sidelined, but it can never be stolen because it comes from Jesus. Those who, who leave the visible fellowship he's talking about here, remember they, they separated themselves. Those who leave the visible fellowship of the local church were never part of that fellowship, had never truly believed in Jesus for salvation. Now, I'm not talking about someone who moves out of the city, goes to a new city, and starts going to another church. That's not what I'm talking about. Or someone who leaves this church and goes to another church. That's not what I'm talking about. We're talking about people who leave the local church, the fellowship of the local church, and never return to it again. That gives evidence, according to John, you are never a genuine, you are never a Christian in any meaningful sense of the word. First John 2. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain they were not all of us. So now he says the person of Jesus Christ, he wants the biblical community to have a correct view of the salvation that we have been given and the sin that's still in this world around us. So look at verses then eight, uh, 6 through 10. And we will, we will progress quickly here, I'm sorry. This is a message that we have heard from, from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If God is in the light and we're in the darkness, how could we say we have anything in common with him? But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. See, God's nature is light. That's who he is. That's his nature. So for those walking in darkness, they can never have any fellowship with God. It's not possible. They share nothing in common with him. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 6, dealing actually with believer and believer, but has, again, broader, broader ramifications. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? That's what he's talking about. How can you claim to be in fellowship with God, but you're walking in sin and in darkness? It doesn't compute. So walking in the light has the idea of believing and doing the truth revealed in the Bible. When the believer is in the light, as God is in the light, they are in fellowship with one another who are, and with others who are walking in the light. This is the message of the apostolic witness that was re recorded from Jesus himself. Those who reject the incarnate Jesus Christ, that is deity and humanity, as the as Gnostics did, abide in the realm of death. They're in darkness. They're not in life and light, but in darkness. Ephesians 2 says this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. If you reject the incarnate Jesus Christ, that's deity and humanity, that God has become flesh and dwelt, and believed in him for forgiveness of sin, if that is not the case, you are living in the realm of death. That's what John wants us to understand. But those who have entered life in Jesus, have eternal life in Jesus Christ, have had their sins cleansed by the work of the Son. That's why the work of Jesus is very important. But if Jesus is not God manifested in the flesh, his work is no good to us. It's no good to us. It's simply a man dying for another man. But here we have God himself that has entered into the human race dying for humanity. And for those who will believe in him and trust him for eternal life. So those who have eternal life in Jesus Christ. I love that Hebrews, at the end of the, old, of the new covenant, he says this. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Think about that for a second. Everything you have done up to this point in your life and everything you're going to do to the day you take your final breath has been forgiven because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Can you imagine that? Everything. That's why John wants us to understand that you can say with confidence and not arrogance, if I was to take my last breath at this moment right now, believing in Jesus Christ, and I died while I'm speaking to you right now, I would enter into the presence of God forever in eternity because of Jesus Christ. That's the confidence he wants us to have. It's not arrogance. It is the truth of what the word says to us. He cleanses us from all sins. So he said, wait a second, I thought you said all your sins are forgiven. That's true. Fellowship with God, being in, being in communion with Him, means I have to have a short sin list. I can't just live in sin just because all my sins have been forgiven. I've got to abuse grace. Paul says, may it never be. Don't abuse grace. It's not what he's talking about. But I remain in fellowship with God as I confess my sins. And it's a present active, which means today He forgives me, and tomorrow He can forgive me when I repent, and tomorrow, he, the next day, He can forgive me. It's a present active. He constantly is forgiving me and keeping me in fellowship with Him as I repent of my sins. Those who don't believe they have a sin deceive themselves. They don't think they have a sin. Is there such a thing as sin? You could look at verse number eight and say, those who know sin deceive themselves. So if we say we are sinless in ourselves, we deceive ourselves and do not understand the truth. Now, I have a couple of quotes, and we're going to skip over them, Greg, please, just for the sake of time. I'd love to give them to you later. They're wonderful quotes, but just for the sake of time, I think we're going to skip over them because I think you'll get what John is trying to tell us. 
God's faithfulness is displayed in his forgiveness of his people and imputed righteousness to them. It is right for him to forgive. It is just for him to forgive for all who believe in his son. So according to his promises, he does exactly what he says he's going to do. He keeps his word. So when he says sin must be punished, he sends himself into the world. God enters into the world, takes on the human nature to identify with the human race so that he can die for the human race. So God God becomes just because he says sins must be punished, so he punishes them in his son. And by doing that, he becomes a justifier of all who believe. He doesn't wink at sin. He's God. He's holy. He doesn't just push it off to the side and say, ah, it's no big deal. No, no, no. He has to remain just. So somebody has to pay for sins. It was Jesus for you and for me. Romans 3.26, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has in faith in Jesus. If a person does not see themselves as sinful, they do not need the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse us from sin. That's the state of humanity today. They don't see themselves as sinful. Start up a conversation this week with somebody and say, hey, what kind of sin did you commit last week? That would be an interesting conversation. Actually, you may not want to know that, to be honest. You may, that may not be a good question. But it seems to be the state of humanity is they don't sense the seriousness of sin, do they? How it is an affront to a holy God, an offense to a holy God. It's just, ah, it's just a mistake, I mean. They don't see themselves as sinful, so they don't need the atonement provided for by Jesus Christ. So when we're telling them the good news, which is that, that God has come to us, that, that Christ has died for our sins and raised again on the third day to provide life to all who believe and this eternal life is granted and will never be taken away from them. That is great news. The thing is, when we're talking to people, we have to start with the bad news first. We have to tell them, you are a horrible, wretched sinner in the sight of a holy God. And because of your sins, you are separated from him. And if you do not repent, you will spend eternity in the lake of fire away from his presence forever. But there's good news. That's when we launch into the good news. When we tell them the bad news, the good news becomes gloriously even more good. Then he says confess. Confess means to agree with. I'm agreeing with God about my actions, about my situation. I confess my sins. I agree with you, God. You're right. I did that. I, I, I confess it. It's true. I don't deny it. I confess it. I agree with you. Forgive has the idea of remittance, of sending away. We think as far as the east is from the west, according to the psalmist in Psalm 103. It's a sending. Think of it like this. Christ has taken our sins and loaded them onto a ship, figuratively speaking, metaphorically, and set that ship a sail, never to be seen again. Or in the Old Testament example, we have Aziel, the, the, the scapegoat, that where the sins were laid on the scapegoat, he was sent off into the wilderness, never to be seen again. That's the picture. That's forgiveness. It's a remittance. It's a sending away. It's never to be revealed again. That's why I like psalmist. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, as great as his steadfast love towards those who fear him, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Don't think of a globe when you think of east to west. On a globe, if you went east to west, you would eventually come together. Think of the galaxy. Think of the universe. Go east, go west, as far as you can go in the universe, and you'll never come together. That's how far he's removed our sins from us. God, the righteous judge, declares the sinner righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. If we say we have never sinned, we deny the truth that God has delivered about us, that we're horrible sinners. If a person does not think that they need the blood of Jesus to forgive sins, they're making God a liar because God said, you need the blood of my son to forgive you of your sins. So we're making God a liar by saying, no, we don't need that. To have the word of God in us means to receive it in the heart, to hold it by faith, and to live it out daily. Do you know this Jesus that John is describing here? Because if you don't understand him, then you're not in any meaningful way a Christian at all. 
Do you know this Jesus John is describing, that he is God manifested in the flesh? Through his work on the cross, forgiveness of sins are available to all who will repent and confess their sins and believe in, in Jesus Christ for salvation. And if you've never done that, I would love to talk to you after the service. I would love to show you so you can know for sure that you have eternal life that has been given to us in Christ. In fact, Acts 4.12 says this, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And believer, let me ask you this. Do you understand the eternal security that has been provided for us in Jesus Christ? This is not something that he says, okay, you can have it for a period of time and then I'm gonna take it away. No. He does so many things into a human being in the moment of salvation that cannot be reversed. They cannot go backwards. Do you know with a certainty that if you were to die today, you would enter into the presence of God because of Jesus Christ, not because of ourselves, but because of Christ? God has redeemed his people through the blood of his son to bring us into a relationship with himself so we can walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship with one another. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this hard word today. It is a hard word. It's so contrary to our society that we live in that does not believe Jesus is who he said he was. Understand that he died on the cross, but they think he died as a criminal or as someone who deserved it not as the innocent one dying for the sins of the world. So Father, our, our society hasn't changed since the first century. It's the same as John's society. It's all over the place, this teaching. We hear it everywhere. Thank you for reminding us of who Jesus was and what he has done for us so that we can have confidence that his life, which is an eternal life, will always be ours because of his work in us. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.